Amen. Amen. You could be seated. High five your neighbor. Say, I am excited you're here today. High five your second choice and say, your hair looks delightful. Delightful. Um, if I haven't got to meet you yet, my name is Matt Cordova. I get the privilege and the honor of being the youth pastor here at the city, which is actually why I look the way that I do. My natural hair color is not pink. I actually lost a deal to our youth students. Um, in fact, God has been doing some pretty awesome things. One of the deals, the reason my hair is pink is I had made a deal with our youth students that if we had 100 people at an event, that I would dye my hair and I would let them choose what color. Well, we had an event earlier this semester at Cook's in which we broke the 100 people barrier. Three students gave their life to Jesus that night and that's why I have pink hair. Yeah, it's been crazy. And he's just continually moving. We had a, a student rededicate her life this week and then we've got a list of students that are wanting to go forward with their faith in baptism. So God is doing amazing things in our youth, but he's also doing amazing things in our church. For example, last week was amazing. It was such a, a powerful service. And if you weren't here or you missed any of the past few weeks, you can catch up with these under our, on our app under the Project One tab. So many of us turned in our commitment cards last week and we're still taking them between now and December 4th, which is our first big give service. So if you like to take down dates, mark that date down. You could do it digitally right there on the Project One tab. Just look for the commit button. You could also drop in a physical commitment card in one of our giving boxes. Now, we're going to be back in the book of Luke today. If, if, if this is your first time, we like to go verse by verse through books of the Bible. Here's why I love doing that is how many of y'all believe Jesus needs to be seen in our culture today? Anybody? Yeah, Jesus needs to be seen. His message needs to be shared. So if we're going to look like Jesus, we need to look at Jesus and do the things that Jesus says to do and to imitate the things that Jesus is doing, right? You know what one of the greatest examples uh, that somebody is a Jesus follower is? Do y'all know? Is that they follow Jesus, right? You could tell a Jesus follower because they're following Jesus. And what better way to learn to follow Jesus than by looking at what he's doing. And we've been doing that in the book of Luke. Now, we are in a big transitional part of the book of Luke because before where we are today, we got to look at the works of Jesus. But where we're transitioning to are the words of Jesus, right? So we're going from his works to his words. If, basically, if you have a red letter Bible, you're about to see a whole lot of red letter text in your Bible. So if you've got a Bible, open it up to Luke chapter 11, verse 29. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, if you have our city app, you can follow along there. Or if you don't have our city app, you can actually download it in your app store, uh, Apple or Android, whatever you use. Go Apple. I'm pro, pro Apple. Um, God loves Androids too, I guess. Uh, anyways, um, but we encourage you to do that. Uh, here's the reason. We believe note takers are world changers. Note takers are world changers. If you write something down, you're more likely to remember. I mean, if you don't write it, we'll probably forget main ideas week after week when we go to lunch. But how many of you understand, if you write it down, you're more likely to remember it. If you tell somebody, you're even more likely to remember it. Hello, Great Commission, right? If we go and tell somebody, we're more likely to remember. So we've been out of the book of Luke for about five weeks now, so let me get you caught up. Um, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus has this crazy moment where some of his disciples get to see him and they say that Jesus is going to be on his exodus to the cross. What does that mean? He's about to start heading back to Jerusalem. And there's some pretty important encounters on his way back. For example, a lawyer, well, he, he comes up and he tries to challenge Jesus. He says, how can I inherit eternal life? Well, you can't, right? Can't be good enough to inherit it. But Jesus will give him this teaching about the Good Samaritan in which he uses somebody that their people despise as an example of how you should live your life. Right? They didn't like the Samaritans, but he says, I want you to go love and care for people like this guy has. Then his disciples will see him praying. And they're like, Jesus, teach us how to pray. It's the only time that the disciples ask Jesus to teach them something. And he teaches them how to pray. And he teaches them about the importance of being persistent in prayer. Right? He says, ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. Ask and, and, you'll, uh, and it'll be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. And that's not saying like, hey, whatever I ask for, God's going to give me. 
It's just saying that our life should be continually running to God and having these conversations with God, bringing our petitions to God, because the only way we're going to make it through it is with God, right? So that's an important moment. And right before where we are, Jesus is about to cast, uh, or Jesus has just cast a demon out of a guy um, and the crowd are like around him is like, well, he, he gets his power from Satan. So, you know, I'm like, that's dumb. Anyways, verse 16, they, they, they keep testing him is what it says. They keep trying to get him to give him a sign. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys to stand up for the reading of God's word. I'm going to uh, invite my amazing wife to come lead us in that. Thank you. Hi, guys. My name is Alexis Cordova. As Matt says, I'm his amazing wife. <laughs> He used awesome earlier, but it works. Um, We have two boys, Bradley James and Julius or Juju, who go to the children's church here. And we also help serve in the city youth. Let's read. Luke chapter 11, verse 29. As the crowd pressed in on Jesus, he said, this evil generation keeps asking me to show them a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of Jonah. What happened to him was a sign to the people of Nineveh that God has sent him. What happens, to the, what happens to the Son of Man will be a sign to these people that he was sent by God. Queen Sheba will stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it, for she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. The people of Nineveh will also stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it, for they, re- um, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah, Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. All right, you could be seated. Let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for the opportunity to gather and to praise you and to seek you. God, and I pray that you would reveal yourself in in just a new way this morning and meet us right where we are. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Are, are there any people watchers in the room? Like you, you walk into a place like I, like I, I, it's bad. Like we could be on date night and I could be like looking around the room like, oh, they're fighting. I can tell by the way um, their face. Ooh, you know what I mean? Like I love people watching, but there's I think there's a, a like a, a next step to people watching. And I, I actually think it's a spiritual gift. Um, does anybody have the spiritual gift of eavesdropping? Eavesdropping. Yes. Yeah, like it's, it's so hard for me to like work at coffee shops and stuff like that because I'll sit there and I like hear something interesting at the corner of my ear with my spiritual gift and everything. And yeah, and it just, here's what I've learned. From people watching, from having conversations with people, from eavesdropping, people say some of the craziest things, right? If you've spent any amount of conversations or, or any time on like just, just social media, right? You'll realize that people say some of the craziest things. I'm just going to throw this out there. For example, we don't know what's going to come out of our oldest son's mouth ever, right? Not bad words. He doesn't, he's not swearing, but Bradley says some of the craziest things. Um, For example, we moved here in the last week of June, right? We moved here the week of kids camp. It was a great opportunity, especially for Bradley. You know, we came from a town of 2,500 people and Lubbock is literally like a hundred times bigger than where we came from, right? It's so awesome. There's H-E-B and Walmart here. We love it, right? It's great. But we come here, there's kids camp. So we're like, oh, this will be good. Bradley will get to meet new kids. It's going to be awesome. And then after kids camp, uh, Mark, who's one of our worship pastors up here, comes up to Bradley and he goes, hey, Bradley, you guys need to come over sometime. We, we can hang out. This was my son's response. Remember, it's June, right? In, in fact, the last week of June, my, my, my son goes, can't, I got school. Son, son, you've been out of school since like the, the end of May. Like you've been out of school for a whole month. You, we can go, oh, I, I, listen, that's Bradley. Another time, um, Bradley was sick and uh, things are just different today. I don't know if y'all know that. When I was growing up, if you had a fever, but it was gone that night, like you were in school the next day. Anybody remember those times? The good old days, right? 
Uh, now it's like there's this protocol. If your kid's got a fever, they've got to go 24 hours without a fever, without medicine, without a nap. All, I mean, it's just this weird, different checklist thing that's going on. So Bradley gets a fever on a Sunday evening, so I got to stay home with him on Monday. And then sun, Monday, he kind of runs it again, so I got to stay home with him on Tuesday. Tuesday, we're in the clear. Like, I, your boy is celebrating that Bradley gets to go back to school. And I go to Bradley, I say, hey, buddy, you know, the last few days have just been, they've been so fun. Like, they've been awesome. Awesome. Um, but I'm excited you get to go see your friends tomorrow. He walks in the room, can't make this up. This is what he does. He walks in the room, looks at me straight in the eye, and he says, Dad, I'm going to score a touchdown, and goes to bed. Like, where, where was football in the context of the conversation? Like, Bradley just says some of the craziest things. Uh, here's one more. This actually doesn't have to do with my son. Um, has anybody ever switched internet companies before? It's the worst process ever right? I'm not a fan of it. So we uh, were currently switching internet companies and, you know, you call them, you let them know, hey, we're leaving. And they were like, oh, that stinks. So well, why are you leaving? And I was just like, well, um, the internet is just super slow in our area. Like we, we pay for this. We don't even get like a hundredth of that. You know what I mean? It's terrible. Like, it's just not good. It's bad. And I, I cannot make this up. This is exactly what they told me. They said, oh, I'm sorry. Our internet is down in your area. What is your address? <laughs> it was too good. Like, I, I love the fact that it's over texting now, that you can, like, quit over texting. So I texted them back, and I said, ha, ha, ha. Do you see the conflict in your conversation? You said it's down in my area. Hey, where do you live? Like, people just say some of the craziest things. And that's exactly how I feel looking at where we are in the Bible today. Look at verse 29. It says, as the crowd pressed in on Jesus, he said, this evil generation keeps asking me to show them a miraculous sign. But the only sign I'm going to give them is the sign of Judah or Jonah. So remember this, Jesus has what? He has just cast out a demon. And what are the people saying? Well, the only reason, Jesus, that you can cast out demons is because Satan has given you his power. That doesn't make any sense. Can, like, that's a ridiculous statement. So Jesus teaches them this. He's like a kingdom divided will tear, will tear itself apart, right? And then he gives this strongman analogy, but the, then they continue to press in and ask him for a sign. Now, reading this, I'm like, you know, how about the fact that the dead are alive now? You know what I mean? Like that the dead are, he's raised people from the dead. Jesus ruined every funeral he ever went to. You know what I mean? The lame walk, the deaf can hear the, the guy that was demon possessed was mute. He now speaks like, what more do you want? You know what I mean? And, and I, this morning I was thinking about, I was like, man, well, we have a different perspective. We're getting to read it, but they actually saw it. You know what I mean? So like, this is a, a, a crazy Thing. So Jesus, this is what he does, is he calls them evil. And in fact, in the parallel text in Matthew chapter 12, he calls them adulterous. And it's because they keep asking him for a sign. And then they say, then he says, the only sign I'm going to give them is the sign of Jonah. Now, maybe you're here and you're like, well, come on, Jesus. Like, what's, what's one more sign? Like, I mean, you've walked on water. You've done, I mean, what is it to, to tell Bobby to wake up or, you know, I mean, to do one more thing? And I would respond to that question with, how many of you know that signs don't always equate to faith? I love what Charles Spurgeon says here. He says, there is no necessary connection between the seeing of wonders and the believing in God. That, that's a huge thing because many of us, that's what we pray for. We pray for signs. We pray for wonders. We pray for miracles, thinking that it's going to uplift or build our faith. The truth is, is there are signs, miracles, and wonders happening all around us that we just don't recognize. I mean, he says, for we learn clearly from Pharaoh's case and from many others that all the displays of wonderful power, either of judgment or of mercy, do not beget faith in unbelieving hearts. That there's not, there's not a connection between signs and wonders and miracles. And I mean, think about it. Let's go to Pharaoh. Think about all the things that Pharaoh saw. I mean, let's go all the way back to the book of Exodus. The first thing that Moses does is he turns the Nile River into blood. That's an attack on their belief system, by the way. Right? That he was attacking their gods. But then there's nine other plagues that happen after that. And what does the Bible say about Pharaoh's heart? That his heart grew what? Harder. But he saw signs and wonders. And he continually to turned against or away from God. Then let's look at Israel. Right? 
They're, God gets them out of Egypt. They walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. A whole nation walks through. They see the glory of God on a mountain. God gives them frosted flakes every day. Manna, it's a, you got to read it, okay? Um, he gives them manna every day for a meal. And then when it comes time to go take the promised land, they walk in. They said, they're like giants. We're like grasshoppers. We can't do this. It's like, did you forget the guy that got you out of, out of Egypt? Did you forget that he's still with you? You mean that pillar of fire, pillar of cloud? You mean, I mean, let's get personal. How many times has God showed up in our life? How many times has God done something in our lives? And when troubles or struggles come, we waver. You mean, I don't know if you've never heard this. I'm sure you have. But Jesus said, in this life, you will have struggles. I would propose that sometimes opposition is the greatest evidence that you're growing in your faith. You mean, have you ever heard the phrase that God will never give you more than you can handle? Anybody? That's a lie. It's not in the Bible. Um, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians. And and the reason I'm sharing this is my prayer is that we would have a faith like Paul. But in 2 Corinthians, Paul is doing ministry and he says it it was taking us to death. It was more than we could handle. Like, (laughs) destroys the whole phrase. Way to go, Paul. He destroys the whole phrase, but he comes down to this statement and he says, God has moved, God will move, God will do it again. That's the prayer that I hope, the faith that I hope to have and that I hope that we have. Is God has moved reminds us to look backwards at the things that God has already done. How many of you know that when God has moved in your past, it's to give you faith to walk through the struggles of tomorrow? You know what I mean? How many times has he reminded, like, hey, in the Old Testament, do you remember the God who brought you out of Egypt? You mean, so Paul goes backwards. God has moved. God will move. God will do it again. He has. He will. He will do it again. So they keep asking for a sign. He says, I'm going to give you a sign. It'll be the sign of Jonah. And then verse 30, he says, what happened to him was a sign to the people of Nineveh that God had sent him. What happens to the son of man will be a sign to these people that he was sent by God. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the story of Jonah, I'm going to share it with you. But here's what I've learned just kind of in studying it is it's not like how I was taught, right? If you read a children's book on the book of Jonah, this is how it appears, that God is angry and Jonah is the hero, right? So I'll tell you how I was taught. God is angry at Nineveh. He sends Jonah, hey, go tell Nineveh. And Jonah runs away because he was uh, afraid of his calling. That's how I was taught. He runs away. He's afraid of his calling. They throw him off the boat. He gets eaten by a whale. He goes and preaches. God's angry. Jonah's the hero. That's not how the story actually really goes. See, Jonah actually wants Nineveh destroyed. Right? Nineveh, if you do studies on Nineveh, Nineveh was brutal. They were cruel. They were dangerous. Right? They were, they were just a, a, a brutal people. So God sends Jonah and Jonah runs away. Why? Because he wants him gone. How do we know this? It's in Jonah chapter four. He says, this is why I ran away. So this storm comes, Jonah's asleep in the bottom of the boat. Sailors, they're pagans. They don't believe in God. They're trying to figure out what's going on. Jonah wakes up. He's like, listen, guys, it's my fault. I serve the God who created the, the, the sea and the land. And they're like, they're like, well, what do we do? Jonah's like, throw me over the boat. Why? Because if I, if, I, if I die in the ocean, guess where I don't have to go? Nineveh. Ironically, the storm stops and the people that were, didn't believe in God believe in God. So God using a moment, like a crazy cool moment right there. But Jonah gets thrown off the boat. He gets swallowed by a fish, spends three days in the belly of a fish. The fish spits him out or, or vomits him is the language that the Bible uses. It's gross. He preaches, Nineveh repents, and Jonah's mad. That's the book of Jonah. That's the book of Jonah. Now, here's where it gets interesting. When you read the story of Jonah, Jonah never tells Nineveh about the fish. He doesn't walk in and say, hey, guys, let me tell you about this God that I serve, who's gracious, who's loving, that when I ran away from him, they threw me in the ocean. And because of his grace, because of his love, he sent this fish to swallow me, which is why I look and smell the way that I do. None of that happens. So the question is, how was he assigned to Nineveh? Well, I I, I read about this. There's a guy in the mid-1800s named James Bartley. 
James Bartley was a whaler, and I don't remember what happened in the story, but he ended up getting swallowed by a sperm whale. Right, mid-1800s, the whalers had ended up catching that whale, cut him open to find him alive in the well. He'd been in the well for 36 hours. And this is how they described James, described James Bartley. They said he was bleach white and all of his hair was gone because the stomach acid had eaten it away. So can you imagine a guy looking like that, who looked like he just stepped out of death, which he would actually say in his prayer, God, you saved me from Shoal in chapter two, who just looked like he stepped out of death, showing up to your city saying, hey, you're gonna be destroyed. Would you listen to this guy? You look like the death angel yourself. I'm following you. No, I'm like, you know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. Jonah shows up, he repents. So this is what's, what, what happens from there. He says, I'm gonna give you the sign of Nineveh, uh, uh, of Nineveh or sign of Jonah, how Jonah was to Nineveh. And then he's gonna use two examples. Both of them are Gentiles, which means non-Jewish. And this would be, create some anger inside of our religious leaders. In verse 31, he says, the queen of Sheba will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it. Can you imagine hearing like you don't like Gentiles and, and Jesus is saying, hey, a Gentile is actually gonna judge you. They're gonna condemn you, right? For she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to, to listen. So Jesus is referencing 1 Kings chapter 10. And this queen of Sheba, she hears about the, the wisdom of Solomon. So what does she do? She goes to find out. Man, I, I had a, a coach, he was crazy at LCU. Um, but if, if, he, if a ball was hit towards you and you let it go by, he would ask you this question. He would say, um, hey, could you have dove and caught that? And if you said, I don't know, he would shout at you, find out, find out. In fact, one time they were doing uh, outfield drills. Well, they, if you've ever been on LCU's baseball field, it's cinder block wall, right? They were doing outfield drills and they were hitting it close to the wall to see if they could learn to read and judge a ball. Well, he wanted to show the outfielders how committed he was to his find out message that he ran into the cinder block wall to catch it. To find, man, I wish we would be a find out generation. You wanna know if the, 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 the promises and the truths in the Bible are real? Well, find out. Like live it, pursue it, seek it, let it develop in your heart and find out. The queen of Sheba, she hears about the wisdom of Solomon, so she wasn't just content with hearing it. She went and found out. She heard about this wise guy, in the, and I like how this one, it says from a distant land. Other translations say from the ends of the earth. She came from the ends of the earth to see if what she heard was real. She gets there, she challenges him with hard questions, and the Bible says that he handles them with ease. And then it says that she was amazed because she had found out that she hadn't even heard half of how wise he was. That he was even wiser than the stories. Man, I wonder if that would be true if we'd live out what the word says. Man, we read about the promises of God. We, re we see the things like where God shows up for people and, and people worship and prisons break and all that. I mean, what would happen if we would find out, if we would live it? She goes and she finds out, verse nine, it says that she praises God. So let's look at everything in play. She's a Gentile who traveled from the ends of the earth to see if what she heard was true. Did she see signs, miracles, and wonders? No, but she still believed. So she left, she drove or carted, whatever they used back then, from the ends of the earth to get to Solomon. And here Jesus has left heaven and came to them. He's performed signs. He's taught with wisdom. And they don't believe. He says this. He says, she's going to rise up and judge you in the last days. Why? Because she believed on less. And they still don't believe despite everything that's going on. It's crazy. Uh, Amber brought this up. We were talking about this text this week. And she said uh, that the, the queen of Sheba didn't see God but she knew who he was because of Solomon's wisdom. And here they've read about Solomon's wisdom, but they can't see God standing right in front of them. They've read the, they've read the text, but the, the one that they've been waiting for, the one that they've been praying for was right there, right in front of them. And they couldn't see him. They couldn't understand that this was him. And he ends with this. He says, someone greater than Solomon is here. Another translation um, is something 
greater than Solomon is here. What does that imply? That not only is Jesus greater than Solomon, but also Jesus' wisdom is greater than Solomon's. So the one who is greater is standing right in front of them, and they still don't listen. And then verse 32, he says, The people of Nineveh will also stand up against this evil generation on judgment day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. So he starts off talking about Jonah. He goes to the queen of Sheba. Now he comes back to Nineveh. Why will Nineveh stand up and judge them? Because when Jonah preached, they repented. Here's the crazy thing. When you go look at the story of Jonah, his message wasn't great. Like he didn't give them all the details. He, I mean, this is, I'm going to tell you what he said. And then I'm going to ask you if you would subscribe to this guy's podcast. Okay. He, he goes there and he says, 40 days from now, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Anybody signing up? Anybody subscribing? Find him on YouTube. No, no, Jonah didn't give them like every info, like all the information. Did you see what was missing? He didn't mention their sin. He didn't go to Nineveh and say, hey guys, like your murdering, your cruelty, your brutality is against the ways of God. And in 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. That's not what he said. He didn't mention, he didn't tell them to repent. He didn't say, hey guys, the way that you live, like you got to change. If you don't change, this guy named God might destroy you. He didn't even mention God. And they're pagans. They don't believe in God. Nineveh didn't believe in God. But with very little details, the Bible says that everyone, even the cattle, repented. The cows. Like everybody in Nineveh repented. They put sackcloths on and they cried out and asked God to, to relent his anger. To let it go. Can you see how God is actually the hero in the story of Jonah? God sending Jonah was God's grace. God sending the whale to Jonah was God's grace. God forgiving Nineveh is God's grace. God is the hero in the book of Jonah. So with no sign or miracle and a halfway presented message, Nineveh turns to God. But right where Jesus is, the religious leaders in the crowd won't believe unless there's a sign can you see how ridiculous that is? When it comes to the sign of Jonah, some scholars think it's the death, burial, and resurrection. That's because of Matthew chapter 12. Some think it's because of the preaching based on verse 32 mentioned here. Some think it's both. What I want to do is I want to show you some parallels between Jonah and Jesus. Jonah has a message, right? He spends three days in the belly of a fish. He gets vomited up. And he goes and delivers that message and Nineveh repents. Jesus has a message. He comes and he lives it. He shares it, he preaches it, he teaches it. And then he dies bearing the sins of all humanity, spends three days in the belly of the earth and is alive again, resurrects, and he appears not just to his disciples, but like as our city seven says, to James, to Paul, and to 500 others. And what does he do? Or what do they do? They receive his commission and they go out and preach the gospel and people's lives are changed. You, you understand that we are here because of the sign of Jonah. And that people took his commission and came and preached the gospel. I mean, at one time, Peter preaches one message, 3,000 people say yes. 3,000 people turn to God. Now, here's what stands out to me. He says this, someone greater than Jonah is here. And we talked about that translation for that word is something. Something greater than Jonah is here. Well, what does he mean? Well, where Jonah runs from Nineveh, Jesus runs to humanity. Jonah knew these people were brutal. <clears throat> he knew they were cruel. He knew they were murderers. He knew that they were sinners and he wanted them gone, right? So the Bible says that he ran. It took, oh, this is crazy. He went to Tar, he was running to Tarshish. Tarshish was further away than where he was called to go. 
What the, for some of us, we're running away from God right now and it's costing you more energy to run away from God than to go to where he's calling you in the first place. I guess one of the most encouraging things about the story of Jonah is that even though he ran away, God's grace shows up and he gives him another chance. So maybe you're here and you've been running away from God. And I'm here to tell you that God loves you and he hasn't given up on you. You know what I mean? And he may have to send a whale to get your attention or fish, whatever it is. But for when it comes to the story of Jonah, Jonah was out on these guys. He wanted them gone. But how many times have we seen Jesus dining with sinners? Surrounded by people that were the outcasts of society, even the people that he ran with. You mean rabbis weren't flocking to fishermen to, to recruit them, to follow them. Matthew was a tax collector. Tax collectors were known for being rich by robbing their own people. He had a zealot. Thomas is known for doubting. I mean, these are the people in his crew, but Jesus knows who his audience is. And he knows that we can't get right with God based on what we do. So what does he do? He comes in and he ushers in the kingdom of God. And while he's doing that, he loves the marginalized. He loves the broken. He dines with sinners and he heals people. Right? Think about this. God sending Jonah is evidence of God's love, just like God sending Jesus. So where Jonah runs from, Jesus runs to. But this is probably the biggest thing is where Jonah wants Nineveh destroyed, Jesus wants humanity delivered. Jonah tells God, he said, this is why I ran away. This is in chapter four. He's, and then he quotes God to God. He says, because you're kind and compassionate and I knew that you would forgive them. God, this is, I didn't want to go there because you're kind, you're compassionate. I knew if they turned to you that you would forgive them, right? And the Bible tells us that it's God's will that none should perish, which is why our vision as a church of reaching our city and reaching the world matters, right? Why? Because it's God's will that none should perish, that we have a message to bring, a message to deliver. You know, and it's interesting to me because Jonah was willing to die so that Nineveh wouldn't hear the message, but Jesus was willing to die so that all might have an opportunity to be right with God. That all might have an opportunity to hear the message. See, the, the sign of Jonah is the foundation for everything that we believe. Right? Jesus came, he lived, and he died on behalf of all humanity. He was in the tomb for three days, but he is alive again, church. The tomb is empty. The grave is empty. He defeated sin and death. It's all about the resurrection. I mean, think about how many of our city seven mentioned because Jesus rose from the grave. Because Jesus rose from the grave. Look at today's city seven. Are there sources outside of the Bible that confirm the biblical account of Jesus' resurrection from the dead? And the answer is yes. Many Roman and Jewish historians confirm that the apostles died as martyrs for preaching that they saw Jesus risen from the grave, preaching that they saw him alive again. No one dies for something that they know to be a lie. Nobody gives their life for something that they know isn't true. You know, Bradley, is, is, when we talk to him about the City 7, he's hooked on number five. He always goes to, to number five, and it's, why do we follow Jesus? And it, he'll, he'll tell you, he said, because Jesus rose from the grave, proving that he is the way, the truth, and the life. The sign of Jonah is the greatest evidence, it, it is the greatest sign for our faith. Like, it's the foundation of everything. They're wanting signs, miracles, and wonders. And he says, no, this is the sign that I'm going to give you is that I'm going to defeat the thing that holds you back. I'm going to defeat sin and death. And I'm going to be the payment for your sins. But I'll be back. And when he comes back, what does he do? He comes and he commissions the church to preach the message so that all might be right with God. So today, really, there's two opportunities. Maybe you're here and you've been asking questions or you're watching online and you've just been wondering, you're like, man, is God really real? I would propose that the reason that you're here today, the reason that you're watching is the sign that you've been asking for. 
It's a sign that God has been calling and tugging and pulling and showing you that he's here. And this is what the Bible says, that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. This is what that means, that, that your uh, account will be accredited as righteous, that because of your belief in Jesus, you will be seen as righteous in front of a holy God and that you can know that you're gonna spend eternity in heaven with him. And if that's you, man, I encourage you, fill out our Connect form because we wanna celebrate that with you. But listen, heaven goes crazy when people say yes to Jesus. And if heaven goes crazy because of salvations, the church should too. But maybe you're here and you've been following Jesus for some time. And maybe you're here and you've been following him. And maybe you've been asking for a sign. And here's what I would encourage you to do. Remember what he's already done. Remember how God got you through that struggle. Remember how he showed up when you thought that there was no way, when you thought everything was going to crumble, when you thought it was going to fall, when you thought you were going to fail. Remember those moments and thank him. Paul would say this in 1 Thessalonians. He says, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. This, this is God's will for your life to be thankful for the moments and the things that God has done in your life. But I would also encourage you, if you've been following Jesus, to remember that you have a message to share too. Just like Jonah had a message, God is sending us with one as well. It makes me think of Pastor Clayton's point last week is that you are called to a circle and to a city for a reason. Listen, you're not here on accident. You're not in your workplace on accident. You're not in your family on accident. God has put you there to be a light. You're not in Lubbock, Texas on if, uh, because of an accident. You're here because God has put you here in this season for a reason, to be a light to the world, to be a light in a dark place. So the question that we need to ask is like, who in our life needs what we have? Come on, like who in your family needs that hope that gets you through every day, needs that life that gets you through every day? Who in your workplace needs to hear this message of grace and God's goodness? Who in your social network, who in our city needs to hear about Jesus? That's what we need to be thinking about because the truth is, is all it takes is one phone call, one text message, and if you're a millennial, one DM. So here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to give us an opportunity to walk this out. I want you to pull out your phones. If you got your phone, pull it out. And I want you to think of that one person that God's been putting on your heart. I'm going to give you a minute. If you don't have somebody, just ask God. And we're going to send them a text. Just tell them, hey, I'm praying for you. If you need a script, you can just say, hey, blank. I just want you to know you're on my mind. I'm praying for you. Let me give you a second to, to do that real quick. If you're good, say I'm good. If you need a second, say hold up. Oh, I got one, hold up. Church, we can either run away like Jonah or we can run to like Jesus. And I believe if we're gonna make a difference in our communities, in our schools, and in our city, if we're gonna be the light of the world that Jesus has called us to be, we need to have a heart like Jesus and run to people. So I'm gonna pray. And maybe God put somebody else on your heart. If, they, if so, text them. It, didn't it took 60 seconds to send a message to let somebody know you're praying for them. So dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for this time. 
God, I thank you for your word and for your goodness. God, and I thank you for the sign of Jonah, that because you're alive, because you defeated sin and death, God, we know that we have eternal life with you. That death didn't hold you, sin couldn't keep you. God, I thank you for dying on behalf of humanity, for bearing the weight of all of our sins. God, give us the strength and the boldness to walk this out, to go be a light, to share your message. God, we love you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen.